what that means is you can make this fit your job. So if there's a curriculum project that you need to do for your class or for your school. So are you, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, and you don't have to say who you are. We'll keep your confidentiality here, but uh, you can disguise your voice if you want to. <laughs> but uh, are you uh, on any decision-making committees for the district or for your school? Currently, I am not. Okay. See, that's that's if you ever have a chance to get on one, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to sneeze right in the middle of this video. If you have a chance to be on a curriculum committee, um, that would be a great way to do this. So if you know somebody, like if you have a, a, a program, now you're at the high school, so if you have somebody uh, in your program that, where you teach that is on the curriculum committee, you could actually interview them and use them as one of your resources, just like, just like a scholarly resource just like reading a journal or, a, or a, a book or a text or anything else. So you can always use field research for this if you want. Now, if you don't really have anything going on in your school in curriculum development right now, then you can always um, either go to another school or go out into one of the education journals. I don't know if you're a member of the Oklahoma Education Association or any, you know, I belong to the um, uh, ASCD, which is Association for Curriculum, uh, Supervision and Curriculum Development. So I get stuff all the time about curriculum development from them. So, you know, if you ever want to borrow something, I have uh, their publications. Matter of fact, we have those publications for ASCD in the library. They keep those there. So, you know, there's uh, and a good way to find articles if you don't have anything going on in your school or if you want to find stuff to back up and help what's going on in your school. You can go online to the NSU Library and use EBSCOhost or Eric Search, one of the education databases, to look up good scholarly research and put in whatever topic you want to do. Now, if you can't think of a topic, then just think of the five curricula. You know, the five curricula. How can you uh, use any one of those curricula? Uh, to as a project to help you improve instruction for some group at your school. I mean, if you have some kids that now, what subjects are you teaching? Uh, currently, I teach government and history. Well, see, if you're teaching government and history, then do you have any kids that have a hard time being interested oh, yes. in that topic? Yes. Well, see, right there, then you could think about, you know, um, if you started with the intended curriculum, what are what are the intentions of teaching government curriculum? If you go back to Dewey, you know, who was very influential on the purpose of school having to do with government, you know, he thought that, that the public school should be all about helping students become more productive citizens. And so, you know, that, that's right in with citizenship and, and with government. The other thing that, uh, you know, that you could also refer to would be uh, uh, when you're thinking of the, of the fifth curriculum, when you're going to that planning, um, if, you, if you are planning a lesson, you could actually say, here's the way I plan a lesson, and I'm going to use this curriculum development class to see how my lesson planning could help me be, to help those students be more interested. So what part of a lesson planning cycle that you've learned most influences getting kids interested who might not be interested? Uh, uh, formative, formative assessment. There you go, formative assessment. You know, all those little things you do along the way to see how they're doing. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm so surprised that you knew that right off the top of your head. So you must have had those classes fairly recently or you've really been using that. But, you know, um, also um, if you're thinking of the high interest activities that you do at the beginning of a lesson. You know, you might even just want to do a, um, a project on looking at high interest activities. What are some great high interest activities to help kids be more interested in government? Now, way back when I was a young teacher, they used to have those, um, uh, I can't even remember, Schoolhouse Rock, and there was one about the Constitution. I mean, those have been around for, what, 30, 40 years, right? Yeah. But I don't know. Are there any new versions of that? Are there anything new? I still use those. <laughs> okay. I still use those for, yeah. for my set inductions yeah. um, sometimes. Good. And set induction, there's a term, okay? 
you know, some people call them high interest activity. Some people call them bell ringers. Some people call them set induction, anticipatory set. You know, there's a lot of different terms that different researchers refer to those. But all of them are talking about those little short activities, usually maybe 30 seconds up to maybe three or four minutes that you do right at the beginning of a lesson to get their attention, to get them ready. Um, there was a kind of a silly movie out when I was a younger teacher called, I think it was called Teachers. I'm not recommending the movie. I don't remember if it had anything inappropriate in it or not. But I do remember that the best teacher actually wasn't even a teacher. He, I think he was an escape from a, an asylum or something. But he taught history. And I remember that he threw the textbook out the window at the beginning of class. And he had the kids actually acting out, rowing across the Delaware River at some point, you know. So everything was very hands-on. So it was kind of a hyperbole of a, of a teacher who really made, you know, the, the, the class come alive. So, right. you know, so, you know, what are things that you can do in planning that would help improve those students' chances to be interested and to be involved and to, to be engaged in your class? So that, that would be an idea. If you went to actual delivery, you know, at the actual taught curriculum during the teaching, how do you adjust for different students' needs? If you see that there's a student you know, like, do you sometimes have a, a quietly brilliant student that you just can't get to answer anything because they're shy or they're introverted? Yeah. You know, or do you have some, do you have that back corner sitter? That's what I was when I was a student. Of course, I was a high school dropout. I never finished. You know, I got a GED. But the I was a kid that sat in the back corner and kind of slumped out of my chair and would smear at you, you know. You know, kind of give you that look like, I hate this class, you know. And so, you know, how do you reach that kid in the back corner you know so during the class during actual instruction what do you do to adjust instruction to reach kids who are not engaged and of course there's just all kinds of studies on that on how you reposition yourself in the class how you sometimes when you ask a question and everybody raises their hand you call the person who doesn't raise their hand and and you prompt them you know about prompting you know, Madeline Hunter was one of the researchers that had a lot of research on prompting. Uh, Bloom, of course, all of those mastery learning people, if you want some key terms, mastery learning or Benjamin Bloom or Madeline Hunter and others that really uh, give you ideas of how to adjust instruction, especially during guided practice, what they call the guided practice, you know, where you're helping kids by prompting and, and the questions that you ask and sometimes abbreviating the question or, or, you know, there's just so many different techniques. There's, gosh, dozens of tricks that you can learn to reach those students. So any of these, uh, I mean, you could address any of the five curricula. Uh, as far as testing curriculum, you know, you always have some kids that have trouble testing. We know that testing is sometimes overused and perhaps abused in, in some schools. Sometimes we drop the character building stuff in, in favor of just going after uh, helping kids do better on tests. You know, and sometimes we drop stuff that are, that, that are hard to test like character development and heroes and, and service learning and things like that. And in place of just teaching them how to choose a multiple choice answer or, or write a better essay, things like that. And so, you know, do you really, when you look at the testing curriculum, is it really either or? Can you not teach across those things and include them both? Or can you not balance the two? So there's a lot of interesting articles on that. Some interesting articles on how testing might be unfair to certain groups. You know, um, um, I know way back, oh gosh, this is might have been when you were a little bitty, 